All right. Well, it is three o'clock, so let's get started. My name is Shelley Reed. I am the manager of Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, uh, fondly known as LSN Tap. And we are here today for an open forum. We're in our website series, and Laura Quinn is with us today to lend her expertise. But this is an open forum for you in the audience and in the community to ask questions about website projects and learn a little bit more and commiserate or whatever you want to share with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Fabulous. Um, and I'm just going to introduce myself and then invite, uh, maybe I'll, I'll call on people just in the order I see them on the screen, um, to um, introduce themselves and share maybe just a thing that they're hoping they're, they might um, leave today with a little more understanding about. Um, I am Laura Quinn. I am a consultant specializing in website strategy and being a coach and guide for uh, websites for nonprofits. I am uh, I do a fair amount of work in the legal services and legal aid world. Um, and that's what brings me to LSNCAP. Rachel, just a word about yourself and what you're hoping to get today. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm with Legal Action of Wisconsin, our development and communications manager, and we just started a website rebuild project. So thought I would come listen. And I think specifically, I would love to know how people incorporated like client feedback and input in the development of the website, because that's something I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to do. So nice to see you all. Fantastic. And you all as well. Um, Molly, if you're willing to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. I'm Molly Rate. I'm a project manager for Urban Insight. We um, build a lot of custom legal aid websites and tools, as well as built and now maintain D-Law and Open Advocate um, for legal aid websites. So just always listen, hoping to get new ideas, hear more about what features would be helpful for legal aid um, organizations and kind of think through our roadmap. Fabulous. And happy to provide any insight I can, I guess, too. Thank you, Molly. Uh, Evelyn? Hi everyone, I am um, Systematic Administrator and Website Builder at Center California Legal Services. Um, and I'm really just looking to get more information on how to manage um, a website for a nonprofit um, because I know that there tends to be a lot of work and sometimes I don't have the tools to get people to do the work that needs to get done. Um, so those are some questions that I have. Fabulous. Perfect, Mira? Um, so I'm Mary Pogoriller. I am working on the uh, developing the Wisconsin Law Help website. Um, we're actually working with Urban Insight and Molly, and um, actually also with with Rachel. Um, so I know several of the people on this call. Um, I'm not sure. I I kind of want to see what other people's questions are. I'm not sure I came with specific questions. Um, it's my first time being a project uh, manager type person, so everything's new. Thanks. Fantastic. And Christy, if you're willing to introduce yourself, Christy. All right, we'll skip Christy. Uh, move on to Yvette. Um, hi, I'm Yvette, and I work with Michigan Indian Legal Services, uh, located in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, I just got hired on as the pro bono coordinator, so. Uh, I know I'll be working with the website, but we also have another person who I thought might be on today um, who has been working with the website, but I'm here to learn all that I can so that I can actually help him with it, so. Fabulous. Great. And Erin? Hi, my name is Erin Riker, and I am the technology-based legal services attorney at the Center for Elder Law and Justice. I do web development with regard to the resources that we give to attorneys that staff our legal advice helpline and a couple of our other brief legal services platforms. So I'm hoping to get some more information that I can apply to that. Terrific. Fantastic. And Christy, coming back around, are you able to introduce yourself? Say maybe what you're hoping to hear? I may be. Um, I'm Kelly. I work with Christy, but I'm, she may be on a call or something. I don't know if we're both on here. I actually don't see her screen, but maybe I'm here in place of her. Yes, um, you are. You so are. if that's the case, I'm Sorry. Kelly. <laughs> 
um, from Empire Justice Center. We are, um, we're kind of in the middle of what wasn't a very successful website restructure experience, taking into a second chapter, um, hoping for a better result this time around. Um, so this seemed just like a really good um, group that maybe could bounce ideas off of. Um, we're currently, we have an RFP outstanding currently to get um, another firm to work with. Um, so we're hoping for a better result from that. So I'd be interested to know if there's any tips or tricks or advice for <clears throat> kind of looking at RFPs and like what to prioritize. I know that's a big question. And then also um, for anyone who has experience between being like the point person between um, practice groups and legal information and making um, an accessible website that everyone can understand. Great. So again, two big things, but yeah, no, that's that's feedback. Really Great. And it kind of over, so I've got, I think I have four topics at the moment. Um, so that kind of overlaps with, um, sorry, I didn't mark down names very well, but it might've been Yvette who mentioned, I know, I think it might've been Evelyn, um, the idea of um, trying to essentially hurt all the cats to try to get everybody to agree to manage different people who are writing content and doing things, um, which is certainly, um, so I kind of heard that a little bit in what Kristen mentioned as well, or uh, yes, what Kristen mentioned as well. I'm going to get in my name, name, which is the right name, Kelly, Kelly, what Kelly mentioned as well. Um, also, um, from Rachel right at the beginning, kind of how to think about incorporating uh, client feedback. Um, so the people who will eventually be the visitor of the website, how to incorporate that. Um, and um, uh, Aaron mentioned, yes, as well, tips for looking at, at RFPs. Um, definitely something that I suspect we got a few thoughts on between us. Um, and let's just, we'll take one more introduction that we'll let other people fend for themselves as they come in. Um, but um, Dana has um, uh, joined us. When, um, it, uh, Dana, would you be willing to say a few words and um, about yourself and what you're hoping to hear today? Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Nelson, and I am a program officer at the Texas Access to Justice Foundation. We're the IOLTA funders for Texas. And we are really interested in learning more about effective websites as we analyze and try to help our grantees um, have more effective websites. Fantastic. Great. Um, well, I think there were kind of two votes for the this idea of the um, uh, the the managing people and content piece of things, which I also imagine has a lot of overlap. There is not very many of us um, that have a website that don't need to think about where will the content come from? How do we balance the uh, the legal versus the plain language versus other things? Um, I, I certainly have a few things. I can share a couple of processes that I've seen for this. Um, other folks have just kind of off the top of their head some things that either more detailed questions or things they want to share as we kind of embark upon the topic of uh, how to manage content so it is both obviously accurate and it's plain language and how to get that all written by the right people. So off the top of my head, um, one of the things I think is the most important thing that I would start with if it's a new process, and obviously a lot of you aren't managing a new process, is to try to think through who is doing the bulk of the heavy lifting on writing. So this could be, I think people typically default to lawyers. Um, so like for instance, legal aid lawyers are doing the writing. Um, and that certainly is a model that could work. Um, but you also have options like um, saying there are advocates who are associated with the project, who are familiar with the legal issues at hand, but aren't necessarily lawyers, um, which can be really interesting because the advocates often have a more kind of user-centered and plain language approach. 
There's also something I find is an underused approach here, which is uh, hiring basically a freelance journalist or a technical writer. So someone who's used to dealing with really complicated issues and making them plain language um, and having them interview lawyers or use source materials to get at the issues at hand. Um, they tend to be a lot, a lot cheaper than lawyers. <laughs> so even if there's a lot of time invested in them, the time is cheaper. Um, yeah, so there's that then who does the bulk of the heavy lifting? Then there's the how does it get to plain language-esque? Which the answer to that is probably not through a lawyer. Um, there's probably, unless it's a very specialized lawyer that you know works a lot in that space, um, uh, which could either be, you know, you hire somebody, you've got somebody in house, you hire a service like the Transcend is pretty well known for doing that work. Um, and then there's a whole review process at the end, which actually can be as painful as anything else in this process to try to figure out, okay, you had great legal information, which may have not been very plain language. You've now plain languaged it. You now may need three different people to agree on what it should say. And that could be really painful. <laughs> so to, I think this is absolutely part of the planning process to try to think through, okay, who has all of those roles? you know, who owns all of those roles and how is it going to flow? And, you know, where is the formal responsibility and where can you just jettison if you need to? Where can you, where, like who actually needs to say yes to an article and who, if you can't get a response from, can you, like if, you know, the state courts are in theory approving your content, but you can't get a response from them what happens? Do you need to, like that article can't go up until the state court says yes, or do you just get to ignore them? So those of you who are running this type of process, which I think is a number of you, are you willing to share kind of what you're doing and how you're managing, kind of how you've set this up to, I don't think anybody's going to have a perfect process. So certainly don't say, hey, and mine's Fabulous. I just to, willing to share whatever you have and what's working and not working about it. Rachel. Um, when you mentioned using a outside writer, it made me think because I don't do that for many. I don't do that really often at all, like throughout the process. But what we did do when we rebranded was we also developed a message guide and we used an outside writer who interviewed a ton of staff and sort of wrote this like I don't know if it was 10 pages or so but it was like meaty of um our core message guide and it completely like redefined for us how we talk about our work and instead of talking about it based on projects or areas of law we talk about it in these buckets of like we maintain safe and affordable housing we help people access and maintain public benefits instead of saying we have the elder rights project and this is what they do and we have this and that you know like so it, it really helped us streamline what we do and I think that was something that um you know was tricky with staff but then eventually because it was this overall message guide we started implementing it across everything and I think now like you know, three, four years later, people are a lot more comfortable with like, this is how we talk about our work and maybe would see the value of an outside writer. So if it feels like, oh, how do we just one off hire an outside writer for little things? And like, they won't know us and they won't like, cause sometimes it, I feel like our firm is so big. Like you hire someone to write something and it's like, it would take me so much time to explain us to them that it's not worth it. But to do like this overarching thing, I think really helped frame for us the buckets that we want to talk about our work in and the language that we want to use. So I would second that that can be helpful, I guess. Fabulous. Yeah, Mary. Well, uh, I just want to ask Rachel. So do you think that's something that you couldn't have done in-house in other that you didn't have the expertise to have done what the outside writer did or the time or something like that? Like it really needed to be an outside person? I think it did need to be an outside person because I think 
there there was like a lot of pushback I liked who we worked with because she she was willing to push and like say like no this is confusing like trust me, I've been in PR for 25 years, you know, like this or like writing articles and all of this. And so for me, I was new to legal action. And so it was overwhelming for me to piece through all that we did and everything. But then also staff who have been entrenched for a really long time, couldn't see maybe the benefit of reframing, like felt like really married to the way that we had framed it. So I thought the outside perspective was really key. Did you have trouble getting funding for that from management? No, <laughs> I, but also I would not have had the time. I mean, she did many, many interviews, like hours of interviews. So that was something it would have just delayed our whole rebrand process by a lot if, if I was going to do it. Just a quick clarification. And then, yeah, definitely. I see a couple of hands. Um, I feel like we're, we're talking about two related, but separate things. Um, there's kind of the idea of creating content for your own website, like so legal content, which you might well want, style guide, copy guide, all of that great stuff. Um, I think where where Rachel is mentioning is a little more of a uh, brand messaging project, which also is super relevant to our topic. Um, so, but I think they're um, the audiences are somewhat, well, they're both internal audiences, uh, but for the brand uh, work, it's a really, it's kind of a holistic look to say, all right, what messages are we saying to, for instance, our donors and to external um, uh, people in, in addition to our clients? Um, and that tends to be thought of in kind of like a fundraising way or like an overall organizational strategy way and funded to Mary's point in that way, as opposed to a more operational, we need to get website content on the site, which is more a programmatic expense and funding. Kelly? Um, I was just going to ask Rachel, and I guess if this isn't related to oh, okay. this, we don't Let's need to sidebar. <clears throat> I was just going to say, what um, what was the name of that project? Like, I know obviously it was like brand messaging, but like, was that, did it have its own? Because we, we went through a brand refresh and we do have a new brand guidelines, but we are looking for more development with like our messaging and our audiences and this specifically like how we talk about ourselves um, that we found were kind of this, we have the building blocks for, but we want to develop that more. So I wasn't sure like if there was a name for that project, like if it was considered something specific or. We did it in connection with our <laughs> rebrand. So like in connection with our visual rebrand, but we thought of the rebrand kind of overall, not just visually. So the message guide was part of that, okay, but you message probably guide. just okay. pull it out and call it a message guide. Yeah. Okay. And it was like through a marketing agency that you did it with? Um, I worked with, I think she's kind of freelance. Her name was Pam Kastner. Okay. And she does work remotely. Um, so, you know, anyone can use her. But yeah, she's kind of her own person. I think she does a mix of PR and articles and um, like ghost writing articles and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I would also, I've also heard of that as brand messaging. Molly, is yeah. that something that you recognize by that name? Yeah, yeah, kind of brand positioning and value statements. We just walked Mary and the team through similar kind of like, where do you fall on this spectrum of like joking and serious? And um, like, how do you kind of just like determining that tone of voice? Cause it all connects into your logo and the, you know, the language you use on the site. That's obviously not legal language and, and things like that. Yeah, great. And I was just gonna say, as you're thinking of about adding all this content to the site, just as I've worked and gotten to work with a lot of different legal aid organizations, and I think I've seen varying degrees of effectiveness on legal aid sites because of organization a lot of the time and how you're organizing all that content. Like the amount of information on legal aid websites is incredible. And I would say that a lot of some of the websites that we work with and organizations their sites aren't as powerful as they could be because they're lacking that organization. Um, and so just taking the steps to set up your guardrails and like project process while you're creating it will go really, really far. So, um, you know, you can, there's a UX exercise called card sorting that you can use that kind of helps you determine what topics you're going to use and then keep that 
as a guideline so that if you have an intern that comes in or if you are collecting content from other, um, if you're able to get a freelancer or something like that, that it's you're able to clearly assign it topics so that it stays within the structure of the site you establish. And so that like it comes up as in the search results when it should or in the filtering when it should and things like that. And, you know, setting up, you can look at or happy to share like just general content moderation guidelines and process so that you can set up trackers so that if I know like there's a lot, there's limited time for people that are working on these projects and it's not usually your only or main job. So if someone else came in to help, like you can say like, here are the steps that a, a piece of content has to go through before it's published on our site, um, just so that you kind of have it. And if you set those things up towards the beginning, it'll just make your life a little bit easier um, in the long run too. Absolutely. Mary? Um to, to kind of, yeah, to go, um, you, you asked sort of originally about the process for the, like what Molly was just talking about, the process of getting, so we, I'm, I'm, we're before that, like we're pre trying to figure out that content process. And since no one has put forth anything yet, I'm going to start with what I have started to come up with, which right. is, um, I, so I have like an air table database that I've made of, um, I started to collect like subject matter experts. And then, um, so I guess what I'm thinking is that I think of a process by which um, things get farmed out to once they're written and we still have to, I think we know who's writing things, but we get farm them out. I have to come up with a timeline. Like if I farm a piece out, give that subject matter expert a certain amount of time to um, make sure that the law is right, then it has to come back for a plain language review and then maybe, or maybe it's plain language review first, then sent out for the legal review after. So it doesn't need a second legal review or something like, I don't know. Does anyone have that process set up? What's the timeline? I don't know. Yeah, I can offer some thoughts. Is So you already have the content uh, and it needs, it all needs review. No, you don't have any content at all. Nope. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like there is, yeah, there's the three main steps. There's the heavy lift of actually creating something. And logically there's something to start with, um, you know, other sites, you know, legal documents, stuff like that. There's then a lawyer review. There's a plain language edit. And then there's some kind of final thing. So there's actually four steps. Um, so a couple of thoughts would be, yeah, figuring out who's going to do that heavy lift um, and the project managing of that heavy lift is really important. Do not underestimate how tricky it is to farm out to a bunch of subject matter experts who perhaps are all volunteer and are all need to drop it to go get their client, you know, not be evicted um because there's always higher priorities and so it's very tricky to try to get people to commit and so it's actually worth thinking through i've been working with a client right now on the very tricky topic of trying to think through not just what is the commitment but what are the ramifications to whom like all right so there's a guy you know a governing council and the governing council has ramifications that they can impose if somebody keeps saying they're going to do stuff and it doesn't happen because somebody is bearing the brunt of that. And it's probably the organizing, or the organizing organization if um, it's not defined who else it is. Yeah, um, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. I was just going to say it is going to be volunteer um, subject matter experts, which is a concern of mine because it is going to be people who are going to have clients of their own and full-time jobs. And I don't know what, I am concerned about people who are going to say they're going to do something and then not do it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Evelyn? I have the same issue as Mary, um, where I'm using also Microsoft Planner, um, really get myself organized. And for the most part, it's good, right? But then it, same issue where um, I, I set a schedule um, and due date for an assigned person to do like that content um, and then it doesn't get done. And so because this is a new process, I'm also understanding the way people work. Um, and when we have those biweekly meetings where we come together and uh, 
you know, either do things in real time or discuss a little bit more about some of the content. Um, but then there's no like accountability there. So I don't know how, because it's uncomfortable to call out someone who hasn't done their work and you need to get it done, right? Right. So I just, I'm having such a hard time dealing with that aspect of managing the website. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, um, another question of mine, probably not relevant to what we're talking about, but I'm also having um, trouble figuring out if we need cookies and compliance banner for nonprofits here in California as well, um, to also comply with uh, the European um, privacy law as well. Um, and, and so I'm just getting mixed feedback from people and I just don't know where to start now. <laughs> So this yeah, is uh, actually, so let's just take that one. Uh, we'll just pull that off really quickly. I, I think almost certainly yes. Uh, email me and we can, unless you have a reason why you think no, it almost certainly does apply to you, I would think, for California. Yeah, you know, I, I did some research and all that stuff. I'm bringing it up to leadership. I, I went to nonprofits here for legal aid. Uh, in California, and none of them displayed any type of privacy um, banner, and that is concerning to me. So then I don't know what to do <laughs> because um, I also have attorneys who don't have full knowledge about the website, but they can give me, you know, some information. But they don't come into the meeting, so yeah, that yeah. is my dilemma. <laughs> uh, email me, and we'll um, yes, uh, we can think it through. Um, Aaron, uh, thoughts. Um, yes, I had um, some ideas about the issue on volunteer content creators. Um, my my helpline is staffed entirely by volunteers, and this only, I mean, the Emeritus Attorney Program is only in, I think, 46 or 47 states, but if you have Emeritus Attorneys um, in your state, they are semi-retired attorneys that get CLE credit and free biannual registration through your agency in exchange for a certain number of um, pro bono service hours per month or per year. And um, if you're going to have people creating content, that may be something that you want to investigate is have, you know, these emeritus attorneys be your content creators. Because then, you know, you know that it's legally valid because, you know, I mean, you are having attorneys draft it, but it may count towards their pro bono hours because they are doing, they're drafting legal content that is then going out to, you know, the underserved populations that make up our client bases. So, I mean, personally for me, I draft all of our content and it's really time consuming. Um, but I mean, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about, you know, my emeritus volunteers who are way more accountable than, you know, an average, you know, volunteer, someone who I dragged off another unit in my, you know, agency, because my emeritus volunteers are big skin in the game, you know, they get their, you know, pro bono service hours, and they get their free registration for, you know, every two years. And in New York, that's expensive. Yeah. So um, I, it might be something to look into if your state has that program, and if you can use them as your content creators. Because for us, it's been really successful finding volunteers through that program and finding quality volunteers who, you know, live up to their commitments. Yeah, absolutely. I've also, so I've had success on a previous client. It isn't going to work for every organization, but this, it was really helpful for this particular organization to use the model of freelance writer that we talked about. So basically to say, all right, we're going to start by sending you know, the six crap articles that already exist about how to get, you know, divorced with children in this particular state. And, and you know, she's a technical writer um, and she's gonna wade through all of that. And with six source articles, she can decide with what agrees and what is the most, you know, useful and take a stab at, creating something and she'll she's kind of by default um gonna be plain language and approachable like so although she's not a writer she brings so although she's not a lawyer she brings a lot of things that are the flip side of that that she thinks like not a lawyer and she thinks like uh more like a visitor does it obviously then needs a lawyer review 
Um, and in the case of this client, we had the advantage of a generalist lawyer who was um, kind of, she was well known in the state who was running the project. And basically she was reviewing like half these things herself for legal content and just bulldozing through the other ones through personal contacts. Um, but that was a model that worked really well on that particular project. Um, another client I'm working with right now has gone through um, a herding of the cats process with volunteer lawyers. They just put a really long time frame on it. When it, it, it put a long time frame on it and it slid. Um, they also had both legal aid and court um, subject matter experts. They had multiple subject matters expert on some articles and they disagreed with each other. Um, so that was exciting. And uh, my client organization had to uh, essentially moderate. And if, if, in fact, we write in some cases. So that's one of the reasons I mentioned trying to like sort out up front. Um, yes, not at all easy. Um, anybody so, else? Sorry, go for it. I was just going to say that, um, you know, it's not the right time of year for law clerks, but writing is a, a perfect opportunity for law clerks who want and need writing um, examples. So having them draft, you know, have each one of your law clerks each summer draft something, give them a subject and, and have them draft and you can use that sprinkled throughout the year. Obviously it's not going to be an in-depth discussion of, of certain things, but it will help them learn and it will be content that you can use um, throughout the year. AI is, you know, a beautiful tool now to draft things. It, it's a great way to get something on the paper. I mean, obviously, you can tell when things have been written by AI, but, you know, it can be a great starting point, a great time saver, at least to use it to get an outline for something. Um, so, yeah, use some of the tools that you have available um, and find new ways of doing it. Um yeah, the um the clients that I have that have experimented with the so the kind of the free-ish tools so like Claude and 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 ChatGPT have found that it it's close, but it's tricky right now because it will drop important legal points. And so you need to do a very careful review. Um, so it's right now, it's not completely time-saving yet, but it feels like in six months or eight months, it might be, it might be useful, <laughs> but right now it feels, so I've actually, uh, we are, we're trialing it with one of my other clients to do, um, so is it any better if we're doing essentially, if we're not doing a summary, but we're doing a direct translation uh, and we have a very senior editor who speaks both English and Spanish, who's kind of overseeing that project to see whether, and what if we use a machine translation, not, not like a Google translation, but an AI translation, whether that is a useful start or whether it's easier to start from scratch. Anyway. Um, Oh, sorry, Rachel, were you going to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, I find it really easy for editing because I, when you do ask it to write something, sometimes it misses stuff, but I have fed like chat GPT things and said, like, make this one paragraph, you know, like where you just have like a lot of ideas or whatever. And I agree, like a close read because you don't know what it's going to do, but editing has saved me a ton of time using chat GPT. Absolutely. I, I use it a ton myself for the type of writing that I do for, I'm just thinking in this particular circumstance of writing legal content, plain language, it seems like a use case that it might be great at. And we haven't, with the kind of experiments that I've done with my clients, quite found exactly the right fit for it yet, but it seems like it's close perhaps. I'm inclined to, there was also interest in talking about how user research might fit into the beginning stages of a project. Um, would be people would people be interested to pivot to that? So we've got multiple topics in this, or do we want to continue a deep dive? I see some nodding. All right. 
with no one objecting, <laughs> if you would in this format, I will, I will mandate a change of topic. Um, let's talk a little bit about how user research might fit in in kind of the planning and strategy phases of a project. This is, again, a, a topic that is really close to my heart. I actually am a user researcher by background. Um, so, and I'll just do a, a quick thought as to broad strokes as to what this might mean, and we can dive into how we might use some of this more. Um, so this could mean going out to talk to users, doing needs assessment and analysis. Um, actually, just a, an insight from a, actually two projects of mine fairly recently is just kind of the point that if what you're doing is a general providing inform legal information to low-income folks in a particular area of law, needs are fairly well researched and documented, um, not in necessarily that area of law, but what they want in terms of technology, how technology can help, how how they think, um, you know, issues for self-represented litigants, how they think, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's probably more likely to be worth your time to go uh, to look at the existing literature um, rather than do your own research there. Um, and unless you, if so you have a lot of money, or if you like, for instance, are a state access to justice commission, um, then it might make sense to figure out how your state differs from other states. Um, other things that are worth thinking about, um, user testing, really interesting. So user testing, not only your own site, um, but other people's sites. Um, so basically lots of people in this space are doing relatively similar things. So taking some models of what you think you might do and user testing them and, and figuring out what's working well and not working well. Um, you can do stuff like, uh, text comprehension tests, which I can talk more about if you're interested. Um, could do, I mean, there's lots of things you could do. Maybe I'll stop there. Um, Evelyn. Uh, something that we have done is work uh, really closely with our development team. Um, we also use Google Site Analytics um, to do some research as well. Um, and mostly with our development team is because they write all our grants. So they know who, who you know, who they're asking for. Also our outreach workers um, who are, you know, out there and, and actually meeting the people who need assistance like this. Um, and they give us, you know, a lot of information on, do they even use our website, you know? And because we live, at least I do live in the Central Valley in California. It's, um, it, it has a lot of disadvantaged uh, communities here. And so they don't have phones, right? So then what do we do so they can get on something like this? Um, do we bring tablets to our own events and stuff like that? So our outreach workers and our development team have been our bread and butter for use of research. Absolutely. Um, that's a, a great point as well to think about the, so not only, so interviews with actual uh, potential clients can be very helpful, but also uh, your outreach staff and community partners are a, so community partners are probably, if they're not right now, they are eventually a, uh, kind of a conduit to like they're the folks who are working with folks on the ground, uh, you know, folks who need housing, who need social services. Um, and so talking to them about their clients and um, what might be needed there as you're thinking through the more complex and unique problems you might be facing. Uh, I agree. Central Valley definitely had, and we, yes, I've definitely seen um, so it gets kind of particularly challenging to serve places where there is no cell signal um, and where there's also logically probably not broadband in a lot of cases. Um, so, That's but right. in, I mean, most of all the rest of us should just assume that, you know, their, their folks are, you know, 80% on mobile phones. Um, things need to be they need to be accessible, not just because ah, someone might be blind or deaf, 
but because somebody might be trying to figure out how not to get evicted while you know washing dishes in a super busy restaurant you know like there's just everything is going on you know like i feel like this you know those of us and certainly including me who work primarily in a you know a quiet office space can forget what you know just trying to find information in a the busy the middle of kind of a hectic life of you know somebody who's not necessarily working in an office what mm -hmm. that could be like um exit interviews with clients can be really helpful on the user experience says shelly absolutely I, and a five to ten dollar gift card can boost participation yes absolutely if you if you want to do user testing um I and you're doing it with a low income population, I would suggest doing it um, in person. So that's either with your own clients or um, doing it with community organizations could be I, I worry a little bit about doing doing it with your own clients because then you are potentially biasing the results to people who already know and work with your organization. So people who already know you and already have the needs that know they know you. I didn't know they know you. Um, <laughs> so, but if you go with community partners, you don't they don't necessarily know you already. Um, but doing things like uh, asking your community partner and, and potentially paying them, the partner, an honorarium to set you up a um, like two days of you know eight half hour. Well, that's too many. So basically, if you're just doing a set of, of user tests, so something like six to eight is probably sufficient for a, you know, set of one to two uh, key things that you are testing and to do like 20 minute user tests. So to ask your partner to set up the schedule for you with their clients and then to offer like a $10 or $20 gift card like often people do just kind of like a selection of gift cards here. Here are gift cards. Select at the beginning of the user test is important. Um, so it's not a it's not a prize for having gotten the right answer <laughs> to the user test. It is a thank you for your time that you offer at the beginning of the user test. Um, here's a fantastic book. Um, don't make me think. Steve Krug. Uh, this is a an oldie but a goodie. Um, it's uh, it's uh, they do versions of it, so it's now on like version four or version five. Um, it's it's about um, usability in general, but it's got it's worth the money just for it's got like two chapters on user testing, um, which really makes it super approachable. Um, which it really is. Um, interviewing and user testing, there are things to know and to consider, but it is, for instance, eminently learnable and coachable. It's one of the things that I do a lot as a website coach is I work with folks who are uh, thinking about doing user research to say, all right, well, let's design something, let's create a script, let's, and, and you don't necessarily need a consultant to do all of that, You, it's, but it's handy to have someone to look it over and make sure you're not going too far awry. Um, questions, thoughts on what kinds of user testing have you guys done? And how did it go? Questions on any of that? Tech? Rachel, I think that was your initial question, yeah? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Mary. Sorry, I was actually gonna, I didn't see there were questions, so I was gonna introduce a new thing. So we can come back to me. Uh, let me just, uh, absolutely, let's do that. I just wanted to circle back around. Rachel, I think this was initially your topic, yeah? Did this answer kind of some of the things you were thinking about? Yeah, I think that was really helpful because I feel like our current website is not really something I need like opinions on because I know it's a mess and I hadn't thought about having user testing on websites that I was thinking of using and I'm like oh per like that solves the problem because I was thinking do I bring them in part way through the process and say like how is this looking but that seems like too much so I mean or like I could but I could also just use the other websites that I'm considering basing it on so 100% thank you 
I've, and I've done that a number of times. Yes, and I definitely agree. There is, unless you're looking for something in particular, like, you know, like buy-in, there's no reason to test something that you already know there's a ton of things wrong with. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, I think it was Kelly at the beginning who mentioned that it, um, she had a somewhat unsuccessful first attempt at a uh, project. And I was, thought it might be helpful if you're willing to talk about it to mm -hmm. describe, if you can articulate, um, if you know what, what didn't go well, because sometimes it's, it's helpful to hear like what, what the not going well looks like. And, you know, if you'd be willing to talk about it, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we actually <clears throat> contracted. I started here in April. We already were in a contract. So um, we were contracting with um, an independent contractor to do to kind of restructure, especially the back end of our website. It was like stuck in a series of templates and just really hard to manage. And 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 it just lacked um, a lot. It had a lot of problems. So we worked with a, um, a website consultant and she had like a good portfolio and everything. But I think um, given the fact that we are a legal service provider um, and our, a lot of advocates visit our resources, our resource section for like legal resources, it's, it's just really a lot more um, information than like a restaurant website or another like simple nonprofit that has like the mission and then like a few items about what they do and that's about it like ours has a search function and there's like hundreds and hundreds of pages of resources that seem maybe kind of random to to maybe a developer or somebody else like just a plain just average person coming to a website but to like the legal community there's like a lot of testimony and a lot of um just legal documents that are important so I, what I think happened was, um, I just think that she kind of bit off more than she could chew with taking on our project and the project management was really what is, what was lacking. Um, so that's something we're trying to be transparent as when we're interviewing new firms to work with. It's just like, like take us through a day in the day in the life of this project with you. Um, you know, we can't allocate like hundreds of staff hours, which is kind of like what ended up being asked of us um, to make this project happen. That's why we're contracting with a firm. So it's not really helpful to have like a person there if everything we have to do is between a basically a two woman show anyways. So um, we just decided that when we took a look at everything towards the end of what we were supposed to be, it got drawn out a really long time. But we noticed that there were some certain search functions and things that just like we couldn't launch um, and sh there was a lot of pressure to launch. So we just told her that like, OK, we're going to actually we had. And while we we're doing this, there was like another brand refresh project going on. So it was like two disjointed projects. So we told her that we we're just going to work with somebody else to kind of like marry those two and get it out in a better way that we didn't want to use more of her time that she didn't have. So I would say top things were like project management and communication were lacking. Um, and then just like expectations from the beginning. Um, I think we just had different ideas about how the project would go and how much time um, was probably being asked to both sides. So uh, that's something we're taking into account with our next version. Um, and what we've been doing is like actually giving them at like allowing them to see where she has taken our website from the back end before they even agree to it. Cause like, Hey, we want to show you where we are and this is what we're wanting. And then on our RFP, we also put together um, like in like sites that were kind of similar to ours that we like. Um, I think it's helpful too for firms to like, they should be just as much as we want it to be a, a like a well-executed project they do too. Um, and just making sure everyone like knows what they're getting themselves into in a way. Um, but I, I'm, I'm no expert either. Like I'm still open to, I don't know the exact best way. And I, I have found myself struggling. Like what questions do we even ask? Like, uh, I'm somebody who doesn't work in web development. Like, I don't know the ins and outs. So it's hard for me to like weigh in and decide who we go with, if that makes right. sense. So. Right. Absolutely. Um, just one, actually, I'll, I'll weigh in on that question that you just mentioned there, but I wanted to mention as well, it kind of feels to me in listening to what went awry, 
It also feels like there might have not been an explicit stage in which the uh, it's actually um, a bit what uh, Molly mentioned, the woman from Urban Insight mentioned that perhaps there was no explicit stage to define how the site would lay out and function. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which I feel like as soon as you get bigger than a, um, you know, like, so you've got 30, 40 page kind of like, eh, you can kind of move the pages around and it's like kind of a brochure wear site for a nonprofit. Um, well, by the time you get bigger than that, it's important to have an, a stage and somebody who knows what they're doing to walk you through that stage to help you say, all right, how is that all of this information organized? organized. Like, exactly. Oh, see what and why and in what way and all of that stuff. Because, yeah, like hundreds of pages, like even just hundreds of pages coming up in a search. I mean, it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. they're going to come up in a search, but I would hope um, ideally they would come up in some way easier than a search you know, or alternatively in addition to a search. Yeah, Evelyn? Um, I recently implemented um, Ivory Search, which is a plugin for our website. Uh, you can go in there and you can um, use indexing um, to even figure out how you want it organized when someone searches your content. Um, and you can you can really take control there um, oh, that's once cool. you pay that's premium cool. and whatnot, but they do have a free version. Um, yeah. For now, Ivory Search is the one that I use. Uh, it's compatible with our theme builder, but use one that would be compatible with yours as well. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you're in WordPress, yeah? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, and let's think a little bit, in fact, you, um, uh mentioned this at the beginning so we we can end it um, with thoughts about kind of what to look for in a website firm um let me i'll just do i've actually been on both sides of this for quite some time i've actually been working for website development firms and i've hired a number of website development firms i would certainly uh i would not underestimate the feeling you get from them that they are, that you can understand what they are telling you and they are telling, they're being transparent and are answering your questions. So if you feel like you ask them questions and you get tech speak, that's, I mean, either you're not gonna be able to work with them because you can't understand them, or I think it's equally as likely that they are trying to snow you, you know, that they're, they don't have a good answer and they're trying to pretend that they do. Um, so either way, that's not a good answer. So to, to, to prioritize the idea that you can actually understand what they're telling you. Um, that, well, and so before that, just looking at RFPs, um, that they, um, that the process they describe resonates and makes sense to you, like uh, for the same reasons uh, that it, if it doesn't make sense, then something has gone awry. Um, definitely make sure that they describe a process for your project. You would want a, it would be called a user experience phase or an information architecture phase. Those are pretty much the same thing, technically slightly different, uh, but that's the phase where someone defines what it is the site does. Um, you want to think about whether, like, how many people there are in the firm. So you have what, what a, a old boss of mine used to call the hit by a bus slash wins the lottery um, <laughs> scenario. So what happens if somebody gets hit by a bus slash, because they never wanted to say just hit by a bus, hit by a bus or wins the lottery. Um, so if you have an independent person, they're often cheaper and they can be amazing. Like I'm an independent consultant. I, I certainly wouldn't say you shouldn't hire me, um, but you do have the issue that if something happens to me, um, and I, you've got an entire, like, I would not recommend you hire me to build a $50,000 website. Like, that's not a great solution because <laughs> because then there is no redundancy to me. Um, so thinking through how many people and how many people are there really? Um, so how many are actually employees as opposed to subcontractors, especially if you're looking kind of at the lower, uh, like it's not bigger firms, it's, it's lower uh, uh, echelon firms. Um, Let's see, um, 
how much experience do they have building sites like yours? Like when you, like, I always recommend simply asking for like, and it's not like they were past this point, but like three case studies of projects like this one and seeing what you get back. And if they're not really like yours, then they at least need to tell a story as to why they're related. Um, so you can define what like yours might mean. But yeah, I think in your case, Kelly, it certainly should be a lot of content. So anybody with a um, anybody with a technical hat on would think that, all right, I can't just give them a something that looks pretty and think that that's a site that's like that. Um, so, uh, and I don't think it's that important that it's in the legal space, but I would say yeah. something that is in the public serving space um, where you are providing, providing information to, are you actually providing information to the public or are you providing it only to lawyers? That's the confusing. So yes, there's both. There's yeah. our three, basically three audiences are potential funders, our clients, and advocates who use our resources. So having that, it's a little tough it just to kind of suss through everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking about like someone who's done something in academia too. Like there's, that's like an in intense website that would have different areas where a lot of content, um, yep. yeah, so. Or public it's hard not to get like sucked into just like these pretty, marketing firms with like great websites and oh that looks so nice I wish it was something like that I'm like that's not even possible for their website yeah. like we don't want that because the needs are they're just very different so yeah oh actually just one more thing sorry I know we have three minutes so I'll, I'll end in one minute so we can ask questions um one so firms often come from either like a marketing and design perspective graphic design perspective or they come from a technical design background. Um, occasionally you'll have, especially bigger firms will have really solid things in both. Um, but if it's not clear that it's very solid in both, it's useful to try to think through which perspective they're coming in from and have they adequately shored themselves up on the opposite end. So Kelly, for your particular site, you so obviously you need someone who can build the darn thing and it's not you know not you know like it, it's Unless, not only yeah. graphic design yeah. um but you also need somebody who's not just a tech development shop who's going to expect you to say okay here's everything i need you know please build this for me um, at least without somebody else in the mix you know like you would need right. then another consultant to define what it is you need um yeah they have like there's been like some things flying around and I just don't even know what's important like I know user experience is big and I know like wireframing is another like there's all these buzzwords and I'm like which one is even helpful for us I don't Those know are the same thing okay <laughs> that uh, goes to show you how much I know <laughs> <laughs> for all so we um are ending the time um but here let me put here is my own email address in the chat I am happy to help anybody for, I don't know, another half an hour or so, like to not some non-insane extent. Um, and then I also, I do this for a living. So um, would love to talk. Uh, I would love to just simply answer questions to make sure you're on a good, in a good place. Uh, but then also like, if you want to talk about coaching or strategy or anything like that, that's what I do. Thoughts, questions before we wind up? Thank you so much, all of you, for your time, and especially Laura. This was very helpful. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm definitely getting a lot of pointers for the pro bono aspect of the legal writing. It just didn't pop up in my head. So this these conversations are important because we have some times we do have those resources that we just didn't even think about. So thank you for that. Fabulous. Great. And please do take me up on a half hour of free time. I'm serious. It's uh, really useful to make sure that everybody, I hate to like just leave things like and not know that people have gotten off to, you know, gotten where they wanted to go out of something like this. So. Um, I just want to say for Kelly, um, 
one thing that we found helpful and Rachel can disagree or agree. <laughs> um, we, or I created a matrix for evaluating the um, proposals we got and put some like weights to the different things that as to how important they were to us, which did require like figuring out like what is a wireframe yeah. and things like that, right? But um, like figuring out for us what was important in terms of like the level of design versus the technical abilities versus like, like for us, it was really important that they had created a website that was similar to ours. Um, like, or their like experience with with that specifically was pretty important. So we weighted that pretty heavily in the evaluation. Um, and so we used that matrix to make our decision essentially, like get, gave people points and used numbers and math. And in the end, like, you know, it helped to narrow down at least to a couple um, pretty clear, like, winners, you know, and yeah. then from there you can, so I don't That's know. That's a great idea where I was just thinking about, uh, this is very relevant because we just got all these proposals in and we're we're still like, we still are accepting them. So um, I've just been kind of browsing through and again, back to the problem, like, I don't even know like where we need to come up with a system for figuring it out. So that's a great idea to like assign our priorities and put weight on certain things versus not on others. So that's a great yeah. idea. We got 13 proposals. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah. I know. I think we're going to be around that number soon. I'm like, this is great, but eesh, it's a lot of information. You could even ask people to do them separately. Like maybe you could drop some obvious crap, you know, like you, you pull out some that are obviously no good and then right. ask two or three people to score individually. Yeah, that, that was something I didn't do and should have, which was dropping some, uh, dropping some of the clearly not as good ones um, instead of wasting my time probably on doing the matrix. On yeah. Them. You want to feel fair too. You know what I mean? That's why I did it um, Yeah, was to feel fair, but it, yeah, they were like single man shops that were not. Yeah. I mean, that's what like, we're trying to get away from. And I think our experience is like a good enough reason to not, we're not just saying that, you know? Yeah. And you, you could do the scoring. You could just put a few overriding factors. Um, right. Yeah. That's a good idea. I think that's what, what one thing I should have done is if it's like a one man or two man shop, that's yeah. sort of an automatic fatal defect and they don't, that get, makes sense. They don't get scored. Yeah. That's a great idea. That's such, yeah, that's really helpful. I and then it's hard not to be swayed too. Like if you had calls with people, like it could be an awkward call, like, and that yeah. doesn't mean they're not going to do a great website for you, or it could be this amazing, like personality connection. And you're like, that doesn't actually matter. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, say yeah yeah it's a great reason to score yeah if you did um calls with some of them or you know some of them that's a really good reason to score yeah at the end we then had a final two that we let each of them do like a little uh presentation with like the whole stakeholder group um and we did use to a certain extent you I mean you're working with these people so you do i think want yeah the how rapport. you interact yeah the rapport to yeah. affect that so we did we did sort of use that in the end i think a little bit to I mean, it's kind of like anything with application and mm -hmm. an opportunity is that like bias is, it, you know, it's always going to be in effect, but that doesn't negate it. You know, it's like a job interview. So, yeah. 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 This no, is I think especially to, I wouldn't necessarily drop somebody because there was an awkward interview, but to make sure that you're not preferencing them because they had a really you yeah. know, smooth initial conversation. Yeah. I feel like that's likely to be a good marketing team, you know, more than exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I don't know about you, but I found in the RFPs, like one of them was just so beautiful. Like the way mm -hmm. they put everything together. I'm like, wow. And then yes. someone's is just like a regular PDF. And it's like, that's obviously that's some factor, but it's not it. So please, mm -mm. please don't consider that. Like it's, it's the marketing machine. Um, exactly. Yeah, I actually <laughs> but do you feel yourself one. falling into that? You're like, yeah, oh, we talked about that. We're like, oh, this one is do. so slick and beautiful. Like, yeah, you just love it. But then we were like, if you use, that's why using the matrix helps. Cause like, exactly. It, you, it forces you to give points to the other things too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Where is, sure. where is slick and beautiful proposal writing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I got to say, though, picking the development firm is A, one of the most important things, and B, one of, it still remains one of the hardest things. Like, I'm not that far in the project, so there may be hard. I'm sure there will be harder things to come, 
but I still like, I still think about it. Like, have we made the right choice? I don't know. I, you know? Especially because we're coming from making like not probably the best choice and our whole staff hearing about a website update for a year now, like yeah. no, it's, it's low stakes, obviously. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea though. That's a, that's a really good idea. So thank you. Shelly, I saw what you said. I'll, um, I'll clean it up and send it to you. That would be awesome. And then if it's okay, I'll share with the community because just having an idea, you know, for people to start with um, is, is a great resource. Absolutely. I thank so, you for asking, Shelly. I had thought of it and then forgot to ask. Um, yes, I 100% <laughs> agree that that would be super useful. What was it? I'm sorry. I missed the chat. What was the... Um, oh, Mary she... had talked about her matrix. So I asked oh. if she'd be willing to share. Um, oh, yeah, then, that would be you know, amazing. Because no not pressure. everybody will have the same criteria, but at least having a starting point of things, because, you know, I don't know, we all are different. So we all are focused on certain things. So seeing, oh, well, they've asked about that. Maybe we should think about that. Or, you know, it helps to balance our own viewpoints. Yes. Well, this has been really helpful. I hope it's been helpful for everyone else. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on what kind of programming would help as we all go through these projects. Um, you know, it sounds like we're all kind of in different, very similar situations, you know, as far as in the process. Um, so if we can provide programming to help, please let me know what that looks like um, as we go forward. Um, I'm going to end the recording and then um, if anybody has anything further, they can ask. Um, but thank you so much.